Hi, my name is Emily, and today we're going to read A Place to Land, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Speech that Inspired a Nation, written by Barry Wittenstein, illustrated by Jerry Pinckney, and published by Neil Porter Books, Holiday House of New York. A Place to Land. Martin Luther King Jr. was once asked if the hardest part of preaching was knowing where to begin. No, he said, the hardest part is knowing where to end. It's terrible to be circling up there without a place to land. But on August 27th, the night before the 1963 March on Washington, the strong and steady voice of the civil rights movement wasn't sure what to say or how to say it. So Martin did what great men do. He asked for guidance, not from above, at least not at first. In the lobby of the Willard Hotel where Abraham Lincoln once stood, a meeting of the minds took place. You have to preach, said Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Most of the folks coming tomorrow are coming to hear you preach. Wyatt T. Walker agreed, but added, don't use the lines about I have a dream. You have used it too many times already. Bayard Rustin, who organized the march, wanted to hear about jobs, jobs, and more jobs, not dreams or scripture. Clarence Jones, one of Martin's speechwriters, yes, even Martin had speechwriters, suggested a marvelous metaphor, a fresh metaphor, one never heard before, a bad check. It meant the time had come for America to make good on her promise of equality and pay up, for her citizens of color had grown weary, frustrated, and angry for justice long overdue. Reverend Walter Fontroy agreed. Whatever you do, he said, keep that in there. For two hours, while these learned men raised their voices and pointed their fingers, Martin remained still, part of Martin's greatness. He knew the importance of listening. It grew late. With a long night of writing still to come, Martin stood and excused himself. I am now going upstairs to my room to counsel with my Lord, he said. I will see you all tomorrow. His advisors fell silent, stunned, unsure if Martin would use any of their ideas in his speech the next day. Until tomorrow then, they mumbled and retreated off to bed. Upstairs, alone in his suite, surrounded by rough drafts and scribbled notes on yellow legal pads, Martin saw Rosa, Fanny Lou, Emmett, Medgar, the children of Birmingham, and so many others, their faces forever seared into his memory. Heroes all chased by snarling police dogs, knocked off their feet by high-pressure water jets, arrested, beaten, shot, and hung, shocked and poked by cattle prods, their homes, schools, and churches burned and bombed. Midnight. Writing, rewriting, rephrasing, rehearsing the lines out loud to an audience of four walls, changing the pacing, stretching the vowels, dividing words into syllables to create inner rhymes and alliterations. It was like poetry, said Andrew Young, the soft-spoken pastor who counseled Martin throughout the night. Words crossed out three, four times, searching for the perfect meaning and rhythm. 4 a.m. The handwritten speech finished, but not finished. Martin, exhausted, surrendered to sleep. While at the same time, up in Harlem in New York City, on 125th Street in Chicago, and Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Memphis, crowds cheered friends and relatives climbing aboard chartered buses and trains, on foot and on planes, singing, we shall overcome. 8 a.m. Hoping for a peaceful day, the shining city on the Potomac awoke to armed soldiers patrolling Constitution Avenue, 
as if preparing for war against an invading army. Noon. Women in flowing white dresses, gentlemen in pressed white shirts and snazzy fedoras, carrying signs of protest, carrying signs of hope, walked past the reflecting pool, watching their reflections silhouetted against the bluest of pearl blue skies. 2.30 p.m. Martin kept refining, painting with the preacher's fine brush, a light shade of wisdom here, a darker shade of frustration there, the darkest shade of four whites only, everywhere. Approaching 3.30 p.m. Introduced as the moral leader of our nation, Martin stood at the podium, ready to lead his people to the promised land. He removed the folded white sheet of paper from the pocket of his black suit, the speech typed and finished, but never finished, and placed it flat onto the lectern. Under the watchful marble eyes of the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, Martin's rich baritone, God's trombone, rang out across the ages, gathering the glorious images of the Constitution the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, and wrapping them around the writings of Langston Hughes, the Bible, and spirituals he learned as a child, adding a sentence for emphasis, replacing a word for clarity, changes made in the moment to match the mood of the moment. The speech was good. The crowd applauded where it should, but Martin wanted more. He paused. Even he couldn't say why, but others knew. Tell them about the dream, Martin. Mahalia Jackson, the queen of gospel, Martin's divine muse who inspired Martin as Martin inspired her, heard what was missing. The passion of a Sunday morning sermon. Again, she shouted, Tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. The Baptist preacher, son, grandson, and great-grandson of Baptist preachers carefully moved the script off to the side. Martin was done circling. The lecture was over. He was going to church, his place to land, and taking a congregation of 250,000 along for the ride. Four words spoken many times in Chicago, Detroit, Birmingham, and Albany, Georgia, but never as emotional as on this day, never intended to be heard on this day, not even written down for this day, not even once. I have a dream. Words he risked his life for and spent time in jail for to convince black America and white America that walking arm in arm was the only way to save America. Martin's voice soared as sweetly as Mahalia's. From my country tis of thee to let freedom ring, concluding with the mighty crescendo. Free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we are free at last. Through the crowd and from sea to shining sea, tears rolled down like a mighty stream because the vision of a world where love triumphs over hate grabs hold of the heart and won't let go. This was the picture Martin painted. This was his gift, further proof of his greatness. But now was not the time for congratulations. There was one more stop to make. 4 p.m. Whisked away to the White House, a house built by those enslaved, to meet the 35th president, John F. Kennedy, who had been slow to embrace the civil rights movement and tried to convince its leaders to cancel the march, now greeted those same men into the Oval Office, extending a handshake to all but saving a special welcome for Martin. I have a dream. 
For some in the room, Kennedy's warm smile and handshake were bittersweet. 8 p.m. Returning to the Willard Hotel, where less than 24 hours earlier voices were raised and fingers were pointed, the wise men gathered once again, this time to celebrate and to reflect upon the day that was. Leader, you swept today, Reverend Abernathy told Martin. You preached today, John Lewis added. You was smoking, Clarence Jones had told Martin moments after the speech. The words were so hot they was just burning off the page. They all knew more battles lay ahead. Angry late night meetings in hotel lobbies, frantic phone calls, tears and blood to be shed, fighting every inch to cross a bridge to make Martin's dream come true. And those battles continue to be fought. But that night brought optimism and laughter, for they all agreed. Martin stepped up to the lectern and stepped down on the other side of history. Thank you for reading with me today.